So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to lecture 10. Today we are wrapping up the topic of fluid statics by talking about hydrostatic forces on curved surfaces. And then we're going to talk about buoyancy. So moving over to the slides. Um, so just a really high level overview of today. We are, um, as I said, looking at hydrostatic forces in a curved surface. So just like on a planar surface, there are really two things to worry about, finding the magnitude of the resulting force, FR, uh, and finding where it's located, right? And then moving on to buoyancy, flotation, and stability, we'll talk about Archimedes principle, and then we'll end up talking about the midterm. So starting out right away, here we have a kiddie pool, right? You might have splashed around in one of these not too long ago. Um, what if we wanted to calculate the force from that still pool of water on a section of the kiddie pool wall that's curved? Let's say the section B to C here. Um, how do we begin to do that? Uh, well, we can integrate. I'm going to switch over now to the annotator. Okay. Sure, I'm sharing my screen over here. Yes, yes, share. All right. View full screen. All right, so how do we approach a problem like this? We could use the initial approach we used when we're looking how to calculate hydrostatic forces on planar surfaces, just integrate over the surface, right? So we could just say, okay, the resultant force is just the integral over the surface area of interest of gamma H dA, but this is tedious for non-planar surfaces. Right, and we can't, like we did for planar surfaces, we were actually able to integrate those equations and come up with some really nice simple algebraic equations um, that apply to every planar surface. We can't do that in this case of curved surfaces because there are many different types of curvature, many different situations. So instead, what we do is we isolate a volume of fluid that is bounded by the surface of interest. And then we perform a force balance on that volume. So we'll call that volume capital V with a cross through it. And so for example, in this kiddie pool example, if we're interested in the force on this curved segment B to C, then we would take this quarter circular volume of water that's bounded by the surface B to C. Okay. So we take that volume of water here, we isolate it, and we draw a free body diagram. We draw all the forces that are acting on this volume. 
So on this slide, let's just write down what these different forces are. F1 and F2 are just the pressure forces on surfaces one and two. And they can be determined by our rules for planar surfaces. Right, those pressure forces. Uh, w is the weight of the volume. And FH and FV are the horizontal and vertical components of the force that the tank exerts on the fluid. I'm gonna make that capital and you'll see why. Well, it's not a tank, it's a pool. Now, why am I writing on the fluid in capital letters? Because it's, it's a really important point, right? We're doing a sum of forces on this volume of water to try and find the force on the surface of the kiddie pool. But what we're actually going to find with this force balance is the force that the kiddie pool is applying to the water. We want the opposite. We want the force the water is applying on the kiddie pool. So when we're all done, if we've found FH and FV, the hor horizontal and vertical components of the force on the water, we're then gonna say the force on the wall of the kiddie pool is the same in magnitude, but the opposite in direction by Newton's third law. All right, so let's go ahead. We've got this free body diagram again. Let's sum the forces in the horizontal direction, set them equal to zero. That's pretty straightforward. That just tells us that our horizontal force is equal to F2. And F2 we can find, again, using these techniques that we've learned in finding forces on planar surfaces that are submerged. Uh, and then we sum the forces in the vertical direction, set them equal to zero, right? Nothing's moving in here. The water is still in the kiddie pool. And we get that our vertical force is equal to F1 plus the weight of the volume of water. Now this, if you remember from statics, forms a concurrent force system. And what does that mean? If you remember from statics, when you have a body in equilibrium and it's held in equilibrium by three non-parallel forces, those three forces must be concurrent. In other words, their lines of action intersect at a point, a single point, and they must be coplanar. They must be in the same plane. That's the situation we have here. So we have a concurrent force system. What good does it do us to know that? Well, it allows us to write the resultant force on the water as the horizontal component squared plus the vertical component squared, the square root of that, okay? So here we go. Um, this resultant force you can see over here on the right, we've just derived this expression here, passes through the point O. So we're halfway there. 
We've determined the magnitude of the resultant force on this curved surface. Now we need to figure out where it acts. Well, we can figure out where it acts by summing moments about some appropriate axis. Uh, and then finally, what I want to drive home is that this resultant force FR is equal and opposite to the force acting on the fluid, right? So here we have FR acting on the fluid, which is what we just wrote our free body diagram and some of the forces we're finding that. But then of course, when we go and want to say what's the force acting on the surface, the curved surface, it's the same magnitude acting in the opposite direction by Newton's third law. All right, so that wraps up hydrostatic forces on a curved surface. Are there any questions about that before I move on to buoyancy? Save my annotations while you guys are thinking about it. Okay, I'm gonna switch back. for a moment to the other slides here. Okay, is everybody seeing the slide that says hydrostatic force on a curved surface? Yeah. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Um, I have a simple question for you guys today. We're not going to do think, pair, share. We're not going to do a calculation. I have a really, really simple, I know everyone's starting to get burned out. Your first wave of exams are starting. Really simple question for you. And I'm going to give you five minutes in groups to just come to the conclusion whether you think the answer is yes or no. Can concrete float? And I'm not going to say any more than that. So I'm going to add you guys now into groups of about five, four or five. You've got five minutes to just discuss yes or no, can concrete float? Concrete is about, or cement is about three times the density of water. Here we go. Go ahead and join the breakout rooms as you're invited.
All right, breakout rooms are now closing. People have got about 45 seconds left. People are slowly coming back. So I like to ask these really basic questions, just sort of see what everyone thinks. We're gonna do a little poll in a moment when everyone is back. 26 seconds. Thirteen seconds. All right. Well, no, we still got breakout room nine over there. Okay, looks like everyone's back. So I hope you had some good discussions about whether concrete can float. Um, I'm gonna now ask you guys what you think. What do people think? Here we go. Can concrete float? All right, that's probably as good as we're gonna get here. So <laughs> here we go. I'm just gonna screenshot this for the lecture notes. So most people said, yes, concrete can float. Uh, one person, a couple of people said, no, um, it cannot float. And it really comes down to a question of what's the density, right? So yeah, if you take a chunk of concrete and throw it in water, it won't float, it'll sink to the bottom. But if you're able to make a shape um, that's mostly air, if you're able to make a concrete and the, uh, if you're able to make a volume and the walls are concrete, but the majority of the volume is air, then it is possible to have that volume have a lighter density than water and so it can float. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen over here. Can everyone see the slide that says, Con can concrete float small group discussion? Yes. Thank you. All right, so super short video here. Can everyone see the YouTube video loading? Can everyone see the YouTube video? No. No. Okay, thank you. All right, now can you see the YouTube video? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Here we go. She's named Letter Row, and she is 16 feet long, 16 inches high, and 32 inches wide at the widest. The con Creek Canoe Competition is a competition held by ASE, uh, where students from all across the nation build a canoe made out of concrete. Uh, we're on schedule, we're on track. So it's just, it's a large and complex project. We're using cutting edge technology, different kinds of admixtures in our concrete that are very unique. The aspects that go into the construction, the engineering is definitely a unique experience since it's not exactly civil engineering, but it has portions of that. It has portions of mechanical engineering and portions of uh, materials engineering. So in that sense, I think it's a really well-versed, unique kind of project that you can do as a senior. We work really well together. Uh, we're willing to put in a lot of extra time. We, um, we developed a nice communication plan over the semester, um, weekly updates, um, project work plans, so we know exactly what we're doing. And we have good synergy with each other. The competition is split into four parts. So we have a rowing portion. Yes, we do put our concrete canoe in the water and hopefully it will float this year. Um, we have a design report portion and we just turned that report in. Um, we have the aesthetic display to 
uh, portion. So we paint our canoe a pretty color, and then we also have the oral presentation portion where we present our project to the judges and explain why it was so unique. I think we're looking really good. Um, we kind of had a few bumps along the way, so it took a lot of man hours to get where we want to be, but um, we should have a strong showing at regionals. There all right, I'm going to go ahead and end it there. But as you can see, the um, American Society of Civil Engineers hosts a concrete canoe competition every year. Um, I've put another link here um, if you're interested in hearing or seeing more about the concrete canoe. All right, I'm going to go back over to my annotator. Oh, very cool. And Matthew's sharing a fun fact that the VT concrete canoe team makes concrete that's less dense than water by injecting air into the mixture and removing the sand component. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing. All right, I'm going to make Beam the co host again and move back over to the annotator. Great. Okay, is everyone seeing now that annotated slide that says hydrostatic force on a curved surface? Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys who are w uh, willing to speak up and say yes or no. It's very helpful. All right. So we're talking about the topic of buoyancy and flotation. And really, what gives rise to a buoyant force, right? What keeps a concrete canoe or any other vessel floating on the surface of the water? What allows a hot air balloon to stay in the sky? And it really comes down to the differences in pressure that occur because of gravity, right? So if we consider on the right, this cube submerged in liquid, we're gonna have some pressure distribution on the top P1, and then because the pressure increases linearly with depth at the bottom, it's going to experience a pressure distribution with a greater magnitude. Over on the sides, P3 and P4, these are going to be the same, and so they'll cancel. Right, P3 equals P4, but P2 is greater than P1, so there's a net upwards force. Right, that buoys the object upwards. So that's the sort of basic origin of buoyancy. How do we calculate the buoyant force acting on a body? Well, it's a lot in the same way that we calculate the hydrostatic force. We're assuming hydrostatics again. And in fact, the technique that we just used to calculate the force on a curved surface is what we'll do in this case as well. So instead of actually integrating over the surface itself, we'll take a volume of water or a fluid displaced by an object and do a force balance on that. So if we have an arbitrary body, submerged in a fluid at the top. It's open to the atmosphere, as you can see by the triangle. We can take this body, shaded in pink, and enclose it in a parallel pipet. So now H1 is the depth from the top surface, uh, the depth from the top surface of the water down to the top surface of the parallel pipet. And I've got to use the shorthand notation PP for the parallelopiped, otherwise it's going to be a lot of writing today. But let's just define a couple of things. So H1 is depth to top surface of the parallelopiped, and H2 is the depth to the bottom surface of the parallelopiped, right? And then one more thing. 
this V with a strike through is the volume of the body that's submerged. Okay, what do we do next? We draw a free body diagram of the parallelopiped with the body removed. So we still have the fluid in the parallelopiped except where the body was. Right, so we have the fluid in the parallel pipette that was around this arbitrarily shaped body. So here is what I'm talking about on the right. That's our free body diagram. So F1. F2, F3, F4. These are all the pressure forces on the planar surfaces. And we can find these using the techniques that we use to find the pressure on a planar surface. Um, w is the weight of the shaded volume of fluid. Um, and FB is the force that the body is exerting on the fluid, just like for the curved surface. but that's important, so I'm gonna put that in caps. All right, moving right along. So let's sum the forces in the vertical direction. And that just tells us that F3 is equal to F4. Um, so what I should say is that the forces in, on the vertical surface is canceled. So that's actually the forces in the horizontal direction. So if we sum the forces in the horizontal direction, F3 and F4 cancel, right? Now, if we sum the forces in the vertical direction, set them equal to zero, we get that FB is equal to F2 minus F1 minus W in your textbook, that's equation 221. If the specific weight is constant, we can write the following, that F2 minus F1 is equal to gamma of the fluid times H2 minus H1. Remember that's the depth of the bottom surface of the parallelopiped minus the depth of the top surface times A. And we can write 221 like this. Minus gamma H2 minus H1A minus the volume. All right, so let's look at that for a moment. So we're just substituting this in directly from F2 minus F1, right? But this term here, this last term with the square brackets, that's the weight, right? So let's look at that carefully. This is the weight of the parallel pipid with the body. And this is the weight of the body that's been removed, okay? And when we do that, things simplify greatly. Those first two terms cancel, and we get that the buoyant force is just equal to the specific weight times the volume of the body that's been removed from the parallel pipet, right? So we wanted a buoyant force on this arbitrary body. Here it is. It's the specific weight times the volume of the body. So it's the weight of the body.
I always go to spell buoyant with an O first. <laughs> Um, this is equation 222, very famous result. It's also known as Archimedes' principle. The guy who got up from the bath and ran around naked shouting Eureka, famously. Many, many years ago. Um, so Archimedes' principle says that the horizontal force, the magnitude of it is the weight of the displaced fluid and it points upwards. Uh, let me make one more point here that A is the area of the upper or lower surface. All right. So, um, the effects of density on flotation are interesting. So, if your arbitrarily shaped body has the same specific weight as the fluid it's floating in, then it floats somewhere. It's completely submerged, but it's not against the bottom surface of the lake or the ocean or the fish tank or whatever. If the specific weight is greater than that of the fluid, it sits at the bottom. If it's less, it floats at the top. Um, so you can see lots of, I don't know if anyone um, has ever been to like the Dead Sea, for example, but in the Dead Sea, the density is about 25% greater than regular water because of the high salinity, the high salt content. And so there are all these famous pictures of tourists sitting there floating in the water, but they're floating so high in the water <laughs> because the density of the water is so high that they can read a book or read a newspaper. All right, one last technical item before we turn over to the exam is uh, where does the buoyant force act? So the punchline is that it acts at the centroid of the displaced, displaced volume of fluid. But let's go ahead and show that. So just like for a curved surface, we determine it by summing moments by around a convenient axis. Here, one that passes through the point D that comes out of the page. So some of the moments about D equals zero using the convention that counterclockwise is positive gives us minus FB YC. We're calling the moment arm of the buoyant force Y sub C and you'll see why in a moment. Plus F2 times Y1 minus F1 times Y1 minus the weight times Y2 equals zero. Um, Let's actually move to the next page so we have a little bit more space or not. So we can rearrange and substitute uh, for the various forces. And we get that the volume of the shape times y sub c is equal to the total volume times y1 minus the total volume minus the volume of the shape times y2. And let me say what that means. Regular volume is the volume of the body, as we talked about on previous slides. V total is the volume of the parallel pipette. 
So this term on the right hand side ends up being the first moment of the displaced volume with respect to the XYZ plane, uh, pardon, the XZ plane. So that means that YC is the coordinate of the centroid of the volume. Um, similarly, we can show that XC is the X coordinate of the centroid of the volume. Um, so the buoyant force acts at the centroid of the displaced volume. the so-called center of buoyancy. Okay, and that's true whether the object is completely submerged, like we see on the bottom, or whether it's floating, right? Now, if it's floating, you notice part of the body is shaded pink on the bottom, part of it's shaded white, the white part is in the air, so it's not displacing, the white part is not displacing any liquid. So it's the centroid of this pink shaded area on the top. All right, one last note that I have is about stability. So if we're looking at an object that's floating, when is that object going to be stable to small perturbations? Let's say we're talking about a buoy floating in the ocean and it's got a small perturbation from a wave, when is it going to be able to right itself consistently to the upright position? And when is it going to be unstable and tumble over and you know, end up upside down? Well, actually that's quite easy to tell if the center of gravity of the object where the weight acts is below the centroid, which is where the buoyant force acts, then it's stable. And it's stable because if you have a small perturbation from vertical, the couple that acts that the weight and the buoyant force provide are restorative. They act to restore it back to the vertical position. If you look over on the right, if the center of gravity is above the centroid, then the weight is pointing down on top and the buoyancy is pointing up on the bottom. And that gives rise to an overturning couple and an unstable situation. So super straightforward. If the center of gravity is below the centroid, then it's stable to perturbation. All right. I'm going to stop sharing over here. See what I've got in the chat. Okay, great. And start sharing again over here. Skip to the end. All right, so we have almost 10 minutes left, eight minutes left. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the first midterm, and then I'll take your questions on the midterm, right? So I've taken some sort of instructions and advice and I've copy pasted it from the instructions of your practice midterm. So I don't know if everybody saw my message last night, but around 6.30 p.m. I posted the practice midterm one, and the idea is it's got the same format as the actual midterm, it's timed. Only difference is you can take it as many times as you want and it's only worth three points, and that's your extra credit assignment for this week. So please feel free to hop in at any point and ask me a question as I'm talking through this. Uh, for the, your actual midterms, including the one um, this week, 
you may have a formula sheet consisting of both sides of a single eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. You can also print out copies of table 1.5 and 1.6 or copy down the values for air or water. So I'm going to assume that you have at your fingertips the density, uh, you know, surface tension, specific weight, et cetera, all those properties of, for both air and water. If it's a different fluid, I'll give it to you, but I want you to have the properties for air and water. You can use a calculator, pieces of paper, you know, um, to work out your solutions. I got a question which was, is it going to be the same number of questions as the practice exam? Yes, the format's going to be exactly the same. So right now the practice exam has five questions that are sort of conceptual multiple choice and four questions that you work through. Okay. Um, I do suggest taking the practice exam as if it were the actual exam, you know, writing out your formula sheets and then sitting in on to take it. Here is what the exam midterm one covers. It covers everything in quizzes and homeworks two to four. I say one to four here, but if you remember, the first quiz was just on the syllabus. The first homework was just that fluids in daily life. So it's really quizzes and homeworks two through four. So that's a lot of chapter one, and then that's chapter two through Wednesday last week's topic, which was forces on a planar, hydrostatic forces on a planar surface. Okay. Uh, a couple of resources that you guys have available to you um, are the summary and study guide, which I highly recommend. They've actually got the boxed equations from each chapter that are important. And they also have a selection of practice problems that you can work through that have answers and some of them have solutions as well. Really, really important on my end, please give me feedback on the practice exam because this is how I'm planning to make Wednesday's midterm. But if there's something about it that doesn't work, um, you have to let me know. It's the first time I'm doing an online exam like this. All right, another question was, is there gonna be an opportunity for extra credit? That's really good. So um, someone asked that this morning in office hours as well. And so I'm thinking about how I can include extra credit because right now the four work through problems, it's just a single answer. So I'm thinking I'll either include numerical answers for earlier steps. Let's say you're calculating the um, hydrostatic force on a submerged planar surface, right? Maybe right now it just asks, what's the force, right? But maybe I'll make it in multiple steps. So what's the depth of the centroid HC? What's the Y coordinate of the centroid YC, right? What's the area that you're using to calculate the force? And then finally, what's the force? And in that way, you can get extra credit. Or I'm thinking of maybe just, you know, if you want to petition for extra credit, you can scan or take a shot of your work that you did on your exam and send it in. And I'm really open to suggestions here. So, you know, please feel free to jump in, you know, on text or <laughs> whatever. Um, and, and let me know or email me later. Will we have access to our camera during the test or just using normal lockdown? So I'm planning to just use normal lockdown mode for your browser. I have never used it, full disclosure, I've never used it before. <laughs> so I don't know the ins and outs. I know last time somebody mentioned that it tends to crash a lot. If we have a horrible experience with it on the first midterm, I probably won't use it in the future. Another concern I have that a student raised is, I said I'm going to be available on Zoom during the class time on Wednesday, so 125 to 215. Is everyone going to be able to use their phone to Zoom with me if they need to? Um, I'm assuming so, but if that is a, if you think that would be a problem for you, please send me a chat, tell me orally now, or send me an email or message later and say, you know, that would be a problem for me. I won't be able to do that. So, um, Okay, question, do we need to download anything to use the lockdown browser? Um, yes, in fact, when you go, when I went into student view on Canvas to take the exam, it actually told me in order to have this, you have to have downloaded lockdown browser. Here's the link, click on it and you can download it. And I think other students um, can, um, can maybe give you some guidance. I don't know if you noticed, but the buddy groups are now up. So you've got this group of five or six students in your class who's going, you're going to make the videos together. Now is a great time to reach out to each other. <laughs> 
um, and ask, hey, does anyone in this group of five have experience with lockdown browser, that type of thing. Okay, questions. Uh, same question, no need to send out work, all or nothing. Uh, I am thinking about how I can do partial credit, if that's what you're asking. So I'll either have it that you can petition or I'll try to work in stages in the problems or both. Okay, and then Kaylee says you can create questions that is a file upload for work submission for us to scan in at the end. It will just count for zero points on the test. My professor did this last semester for partial credit purposes. Oh, okay, so like a PDF version, Kaylee, of the exam that you can sort of fill out. Yeah, okay. Do you know? Do you, did uh, did your professor use lockdown? But you haven't done a lockdown, yeah. So this is going to kind of be a a test run <laughs> of lockdown. And if you know, if we hate it because it impedes our ability to do things like what Kaylee suggested for extra credit, you know, I'm open to also not using it. But I really just don't know the ins and outs. Okay, it could be a Canvas assignment afterwards, not on lockdown. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Okay, and Meredith says, with lockdown, you have to create a separate assignment to upload a PDF scan after you exit out. Okay. Uh, Jack says, do you think we could have more than 50, minute, 50 minutes to compensate for the difficulties of an online exam? Um, yeah, I am completely open to that, actually. And since for most of you, this is going to be the, or for many of you, this will be the first time that you're dealing with lockdown browser. Yeah, I'm absolutely happy to tack some extra time on. Okay, awesome. These are great ideas. Thank you. Um, we're coming up on the, it's 2.14. We got about another minute. I would really just love any feedback, suggestions. Uh, let me know what else would be helpful to you. I am going to now give you extra time and upload a PDF because I think that's a great idea. Okay, so extra 15 minutes at the end to allow for upload time. Uh, is 15 minutes enough for nine questions? Well, five of those nine questions are, you know, multiple choice and four of them are work through. They're not multiple part work through. So it's not find the X component of the reaction and the Y component. So I'm asking sort of just one calculation problem. We will try it. <laughs> uh, we will try it and see how it goes. You know, if everybody does worse on the first exam, the course is curved, right? So it won't hurt you individually. It'll just mean that what makes an A in this class is, you know, lower than it, what it would have been otherwise. And then we can make adjustments for the second midterm. All right, any other questions? All right, we're coming up against our time here. So um, feel free to email me if you have questions. Please take the practice midterm and just let me know your feedback. I really could use your feedback. And um, I think that's it. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Have a great week. And I will see you um, either during the exam or on Monday next week. Have a good one.